Uh, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, grab, grab a Bible at the back. I want you to hold God's Word uh, in your hand. We have tablets we pass to the aisle. Everybody puts their name in the tablet. If you're new here this morning, give us a phone number and email. We want to make it as easy as possible to learn about what Jesus is doing in, in North Village Church. We have our elementary students in here today. We've got our teenagers in here today. Uh, we're excited. This morning we're going to launch a new series in Colossians called Bearing Fruit. And, and the purpose of our series is to complement our initiate focus this year. You can go to page 71 probably, somewhere around there. You can, you can start uh, for, on the message we'll look at next Sunday, tomorrow. Start reading. Our, our, our idea behind initiate is to uh, initiate deeper, rooted and growing relationships uh, with one another. Uh, so in the fall, we trained. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we had 14 men and women get together, and we trained uh, 14 men and women about what it means to be in deeper, uh, growing relationships with one another. And then this winter, we're launching, uh, it's about 38, 40 men and women, uh, not just coming on Sunday morning, not just showing up in community group, but in, in deeper, rooted, and growing relationships uh, with one another. And our prayer is that our relationship with Jesus would take such center stage in our lives that it would uh, move us into thriving, deeper relationships with one another. And, and by God's grace, we already see evidence of that in our church family. Praise God. We see evidence of deeper relationships. And we're praying, we're hoping that Colossians keeps pressing in. Colossians keeps encouraging us and stirring up in us a love for deeper relationships with one another. So grab one of these handouts under your chair. Young people, grab one of these handouts. Write down what you're learning in God's Word. Follow along with us this morning. God's Word has something for you, young people, so track with me. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. We'll start off. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. So when you study Scripture, you always want to draw out the context of what you are reading by identifying the author and the audience. And in verse 1, we see the author is Paul. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Write that down. The author is uh, Paul. Now, Paul's just a regular guy. Paul's just a regular guy. He didn't grow up going to church. He didn't, he didn't grow up doing the Jesus thing. In fact, he, he grew up hating uh, Christians, uh, hating Jesus. He was chasing down Christians to throw them in jail. So not a fan. Uh, you know, sometimes even murdering Christians. So he was so against Christianity. But you can read Acts chapter 9. Paul's life is transformed by Jesus so that Paul spends the rest of his life proclaiming the name of Jesus. So you got to know the author is Paul. Uh, now, when you study Scripture on your own, there's a question that's going to pop in your mind. There, there's a question that's going to uh, uh, come from our friends and family. It's that, well, if the Bible's written by people, how can you trust the Scriptures? Does that make sense? If the Bible is written by ordinary people, then how can you trust uh, the Scriptures? Young people, listen to me. Your friends in school... Uh, they're going to come at you with this question. Uh, and, and, and the thought is, if the Bible's written by people, people are broken, people are fallen, people are imperfect, ergo, well, maybe the scriptures are broken and imperfect. You can't trust them. So write this down. Get ready for it. All scripture is inspired by God. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Write that in your notes. The word inspired means God breathed. That these words are God-breathed. So, that, so that's about people. These words are written by people. But you need to remember that it's the God of Scripture working through people. Does that make sense? Track with me on this. If the God of Scripture can speak creation into existence, well, then he's, he's certainly powerful enough to overcome the imperfections of people right. and accomplish his purpose. Right, write that in your notes. Man. All scripture is God-breathed, inspired. Right? So the key, idea, the key idea is that the Bible is written by many people. This is what gives you some confidence. The Bible is written by many people. Every other religious text is written by one person wandering off uh, into the woods and, and writing down, like, this is what I think God is like. If you look at Islam, that's how the Quran is written. Muhammad has a vision, writes it down. If you look at the Mormon church, Joseph Smith has a vision, write it down. That, that's all speculation. Right? God's word is written by multiple people. 
right? Multiple people. You got 44 different authors. You can write this in your notes. 44 different authors from the Old Testament to the New Testament over a 1500 year period. 1500. A lot of time passes by multiple generations coming from a variety of different backgrounds, from shepherds to nobility. And it all has one central message that Jesus Christ is the hope of humanity. That Jesus Christ is the hope of humanity. One guy off in the woods, that's called speculation. 44 different authors, variety of different backgrounds, 1,500 year period, one central message, that's called supernatural revelation. Right? We are studying these words this morning because Paul is such a great guy. And we're studying these words because they are the inspired <laughs> words of God. That Paul, right, that the God of Scripture just happens to move through Paul and its intent is to point us to Jesus. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So verse 1, we see the author. In verse 2, you see the audience. And the audience is just a regular group of men, women, and children from a church uh, in a city called Colossae. Uh, it's in modern-day Turkey. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a city that's on a river with two other cities. It's like uh, Port Arthur and Beaumont and Orange, right? The Golden Triangle in Texas. That's what Colossae is like, surrounded by two other cities and a, and a river where the Golden Triangle in Texas is known for oil, but Colossae, these other cities, they're, they're actually known for their uh, farming community. They're known for sheep. They're known for wool. They're known for fabrics and for dyes. And people would come from all over the world to pursue their fabrics and, and dyes. But if you look there at verse 2, verse 2, the Apostle Paul does describe them as shepherds. Is that the shepherds of Colossae or farmers or sellers of fashionable tunics? No, how are they described? Look at verse 2. Saints and faithful brethren in Christ. Circle that word saints. Sometimes we think of, because of the Catholic Church, we think of the word saint, we think of, uh, you know, like special people. You know, people that are made into statues. Legendary uh, figures, you know, that you wear in a necklace around your neck. You know, like that. Oh, Saint, like there's a there's a suburb outside of Paris called Saint Denis. My background, my people. Saint Denis, maybe Denise. I don't know how you say it with an accent. Uh, but the story of Saint Denis is that he's a pastor uh, who gets his head chopped off. Yeah, and then wait for it, Alex. He picks up his head and he holds his head as he walks around several miles. Proclaiming the name of Jesus. Wow. And they're like, that guy needs to be a saint. Right? <laughs> I'm guessing that's probably not true. I, I said probably. I don't know. <laughs> that's a cool story and all. But that's not how saints are described in Scripture. Listen to this, young people. Scripture, when you become a Christian, by grace through faith in Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, God's Word calls you a saint. You don't have to get your head chopped off. It's not about morality. It's not about being Mother Teresa. It's not about how good or bad that you are. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Christ. It calls you saints. That we're dead in our sin. And Jesus reaches into the abyss of death. And he doesn't just pull us back to Eden. He doesn't just forgive us and cleanse us. But he catapults us into the heights of the heavens by pouring his righteousness on us. That's why we're called saints. Adopted sons and daughters. Sit at his table. That's, that's our identity. This is the good news of Jesus. When you look in the mirror and you're working out your attire for the day, you're like, saint. In Christ Jesus. Because that's who you are. If you got to get a robe, if you need to put on a collar, I don't know, maybe that helps. Uh, but it's not the clothes, the robe, or the collar that makes you a saint. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ freely given to you by grace through faith. I mean, just last Friday, a couple days ago, uh, my family, we walk into a Wendy's. I got a 15-year-old daughter. See some of her friends. They get so excited. They run off, eat their chicken nuggets, whatever. They're, they're, they're excited having, having friend time. And uh, I don't know why, but one of her friends, one of my daughter's friends, 
thinks it's cool that I'm a pastor. Is if you're wanting to know what 15 year olds think, it's cool, it's this, it's Billie Eilish and pastors. <laughs> so they're hanging out in their friendship time, and my daughter tells me at some point, her friend realizes uh, that we're in the room. And she says, wait a minute, your mom and dad are in this room? They're like, he's in the building! Like, like, and then her friend, 15 years old, says, quick, everybody, let's grab hands. Let's bow our heads. Let's look like we're praying so they see us praying. Yeah, oh, my God. You know why? I mean, she's probably being silly, 15-year-old girl, but she's also, like, she's thinking, like, well, there's, there's regular people, and then there's pastors. Right? You need to know that's not what the Scriptures teach. By grace, through faith in Jesus, the righteousness of Christ is poured out onto you. How, how, could, the pa how could the title of pastor possibly improve, improve upon what we are given in Christ? Does that make sense? Yeah. That, that's what you are when you look in the mirror. And when you go throughout your day and the enemy creeps in with whispers and lies about your past, present, and future, you just say, devil, please. I'm in Christ. Because that's who we are. That's who the Colossians are. That's how they're identified. That's the audience. Saints and faithful brethren. Look at verses 3 and 4. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Look at verses 3 and 4. Listen, the assumption in Scripture is that when you come to faith in Jesus... Right? We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus that there is a result. You see the result? A love which you have for all the saints. The assumption in Scripture is that when you are in Christ, that you become new. That you have new identity. You have new clothes. You have a new mind. You have a new perspective. You're a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. If you're new in Christ, that you are a saint, not just Brought to even, but to the heights of heavens, you are in Christ. And the assumption in Scripture is that there is a result. The result is a love for all the saints. You see that in Scripture? That, that's, that's the byproduct. Now, it's confusing for us today because we have a lot of different definitions of what it means to be loving today. I mean, have you noticed there's different, like what I think love uh, like is this. Like there's, there's some of us who, who think uh, it's, it's loving to never get involved in anybody's life. Right? It's, it's not my place. Who, who am I? It's not my place to say anything. I don't want to get in their, their business. Who am I to say, you know, and so we, it's like, I call it sneaky love. You know, like you never know it's there, but you know, it's, it's, it's there. And, and then there's some of us on the other extreme that love, they think it's loving, we think it's loving just to boss people around. Have you had some of that love poured out upon you? People telling you what to do. You're doing this wrong. Stop doing that. Start doing this. You need to do this. I call it bossy love. Bossy love, right? There's also ambiguous love. Like, who you love? Everybody. Everybody. I just love the world. I'm just sending out love. I love that one. I'm sending out love to the world. Who? Just the world. Like, all 7 billion people are embracing my love. It's easy to love people who are nice to us, right? It's easy to love people who give us things, buy us things, laugh at our, our jokes. But verse 4, the Apostle Paul says that we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. We've, we're hearing about the love you have for all the saints. But that word love in the original language is the word agape. And the word agape in the original language means sacrificial love. Write that down in your notes. Agape is sacrificial love love. It's the type of love that requires you to die to yourself, to your preferences, to your time, to your comforts, your reputation. Agape love is sacrificing for others when it's not reciprocated. Agape love is giving of ourselves when it's not noticed or even appreciated. Agape love is what we see in Jesus, isn't it? Agape love is, is Jesus looking upon us when we are undeserving, unlovely, ungrateful, dead in our sin, reaches into the abyss, and not just back to evil, but all of his love in Christ is poured out onto us so that we are saints. Agape love is supernatural love. 
it's the type of love that, that produces uh, an effect. And this is why we're talking about uh, initiating deeper relationships with one another. This is why we're pressing in to, uh, uh, to, to deeper commitment to one another. Because the assumption is that if you're in Christ, there's going to be there's going to be a result. There's going to be a sacrificial type of love that we're going to see in our church family, right? Right? And our church family is special. In most church families, everybody kind of looks alike, talks alike, walks alike, votes alike. Not our church family. Right? We're all coming from different backgrounds. We didn't plan it that way. We just proclaim the name of Jesus. People come. And these people come from, from different backgrounds and sometimes have, <coughs> sometimes some of us have very little in common, right? You're like, I can't think of anything to think of, to talk about with this person. But you know what we do have in common? It's Jesus Christ. And it's that agape love in Christ that propels us towards one another. It's that agape love that transforms our relationships with one another. Why? Because we've been reconciled to Christ. We've been brought together in Christ. It affects us. We're going to see a result. Like I noticed when, uh, when I watch movies, I'm a little annoyed to go see a movie with because I kind of take on the personality of the movie. Like if I go see Transformers, if I sit two and a half hours walking, watching Transformers, I will walk out of the room, you know, acting like a Transformer. Where I'm like, shh, 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 let's go. It's funny to my family for like 30 seconds, and then two days later they're like, dear God, please stop. If I watch a movie about Italian gangsters, I mean, for weeks I'm like, forget about it. You know, what are you, what are you gonna do? Like I just take on, right? Because I've sat in the movie for two hours, it has an effect on me. That's what scripture is describing there. Is that we've been reconciled to Jesus Christ. We've been, we've been called saints. We have a new identity. There is absolutely an effect. It's going to affect how we approach our relationships. That we're going to invest in community groups. Not because it's easy. Not because the people are there to get all our jokes. But because we have a love for one another. And we see that. We see that in our church family. Praise God. We see evidence of that. Praise God. I see it when you, when you, when you, when I see two different people, two different backgrounds come together. And at first, I get a little nervous. I'm like, oh, this could be, this could be interesting. And then you start laughing, you start hugging, you start hanging out. Yeah, there's differences. There's things you disagree about. But there's a love for one another that's transformative. Praise God. And that's what we want to see in our, in our church family. We see it already, and we're praying that we can see more of that in our church family. Look at verses 5 and 6. The Apostle Paul writes, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. In verse 5, we see words like the gospel, it's the news. Verse 6, you see words like all the world, because all the world is invited to know Jesus. You see words like constantly bearing fruit and increasing, because there's power in Jesus that transforms lives. But I want us to focus on this phrase, because of the hope laid up, for you in heaven. The phrase is so important. The phrase laid up for you in heaven means there's something that's being <coughs> saved. Laid up means it's saved. That when you are in Christ, there's something saved for you in the future. And it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. It's yours in Christ. There, there's, there's something being laid up for you in Christ. And this phrase is so important because this phrase is the explanation of for the transformation that we were just reading about. Does that make sense? In verses 3 and 4, he's like, I've heard of your faith in Christ. I've heard of your love for all the saints. And he says, because. It's the explanation. The, the reason we're seeing verse 4 is because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. It's possible that some of us are here this morning and, and you're thinking, man, I want to see more agape love. I want to see more commitment to one another. This is where it starts. I want to see more diversity. You see some different backgrounds. I want to see more different backgrounds and more people overcoming those backgrounds 
in Christ. I want to see that, that, that fruit constantly showing up in our church family. This is it right here. Man, it's because of the hope laid up for you. Maybe some of us feel a little overwhelmed. You think about that, that phrase that it says in, in verse 2, like a love for all the saints. You're like, that's a lot of people. It feels a little bit overwhelming. You're like, I'm just trying to keep my laundry clean. I'm trying to keep my head above the water. You need, you need to know it's, it's able to happen because of the hope. It's the explanation for the transformation. Does that make sense? When you see that phrase, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, you need to think in your mind this image of a leash. That when you are in Christ, because of that hope, there's this long leash that's anchoring us to Christ. That's anchoring Christ to us. Does that make sense? Like a long, long, hopefully a really, really long uh, leash, right, that, that, that's going to pull us into uh, Christ. Uh, I think about it like uh, I have a dog named Roscoe. Roscoe is a 90-pound uh, red bone uh, coon hound. And here, I'll just show a picture of uh, uh, four years. It's just a picture of Roscoe. That's Roscoe. <laughs> Roscoe loves to go on walks, and because he's a coon hound, he loves to smell. Roscoe's all about the smell. When you walk Roscoe, his nose is like, it's like on the ground, just like scraping, and he, he's just smelling. Just every, like every three feet, he stops. He wants to smell. Like, I've never smelled. He's like, I've never smelled this in my life. It's, mm, what urine is this? This is mm, amazing. He just smells it. It's like, he just does a lot of like, and then, and then like after 20 sniffs, he'll let off a big exhale, just and just snot everywhere, right? Because he's just he's taking in on these all these all these all these smells. Well, the key to walking Roscoe, because he's so excited about those smells, is the leash. Man, you gotta keep Roscoe on a leash, right? That's the stability. That's the safety. We're anchoring ourselves to Roscoe because otherwise he'll take off. He's gonna smell something and run. And sometimes I get a little adventurous. I'm like, let's let's let him go off leash. It's never a good idea. It's never a good idea. He's just like, he's convinced. He's storing up smells, and he just bolts. That's why the key is you got to have Roscoe on a leash. In verse 5, when you see the phrase, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, right, that's, that's God's way of saying, like, man, I got you. Like, you're on a leash. You're in Christ. Your title of saint is not just, like, a nice description. He's got you. That's our safety. That's our security. Like no matter what happens, the moment you believe in Jesus, by grace through faith in Jesus, that, that leash is attached. You're anchored in him. And there's nothing you can ever do to break it. There's nothing you can ever do to break it, even when you try to go off leash. Right? Let's be honest. Some of us, uh, we chase some smells in life, don't we? we? We get excited about certain smells and we start running. Right? We go off leash sometimes. Sometimes our, our smells go dull. Man, it doesn't matter. He's got us. He's saying, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, that's why they're seeing this type of love in their midst. It's a agape transformative love because they know they're anchored in Christ, that he has got them no matter what, and it's changing how they live. Does that make sense? Sometimes we... Uh, we think, man, I gotta read a different book, or I, I gotta listen to a different podcast, I gotta listen to a different pastor, I gotta go to a different church, I gotta change cities. Man, none of that's the answer. The answer is Jesus. That's the secret for the Colossian church. The answer is Jesus. Their faith in Christ is so powerful, it's producing a love, a result, and the explanation is because their hope is on that reward that's coming. Right, that future hope is changing how they live. That future hope is changing how they live today. Think about that. There's a story of uh, these two men who are placed in a room. And, and there's windows so people can watch them. It's kind of an experiment. And while they're in the room, their task is to take paper, simple task, take the paper, fold it, put it in a box. Two men are placed in the room. They go at it. Fold the paper, put it in the box. People are watching. Fold the paper, put it in the box. Fold the paper, put it in the box. One of the men starts to get a little irritated. Seeing people watching him, he's getting frustrated. He's just like, all right, man, come on. Is this all they want us to do? 
He's getting a little frustrated. This, this, this task is boring. He's kind of vocalizing like, hello, like how long are we going to be in here? Pull the paper, put it in the box. Pull the paper, starts to push his chair back. He starts to walk around. Hey, can I get out of here? Come on. Meanwhile, the second man, oddly enough, he's not affected at all. The first guy, he's irritated, walking around. I got to get out of here. I want to quit. The first guy, just phone this paper, put in the box. People watching, phone this paper, put in the box. Guy's complaining. He's like, that's all right. That's not me. This is me right here. Paper in box. Paper in box. Sometimes he's smiling, whistling a song. He's like, paper in box. And it wasn't until later that people watching found out well, the first man was paid minimum wage at the end of his day of folding paper and putting in a box. But the second man was paid a million dollars to fold paper and put it in a box. You see what I'm saying? Man, the, the promise of that future hope, well, it changed everything. For the first guy, it's just minimum wage. What do I care? I can walk away from it. But that first guy is like, you want me to fold paper for a million dollars? All day, I can do that. <laughs> well, in verse 5, we're not talking about a future hope of a million dollars. I mean, a future hope of a million dollars is pretty awesome, but a million dollars can get spent. A million dollars can disappear. What we're talking about in verse 5 is Jesus Christ. And the hope we have, Jesus Christ is eternal. We're not talking about a million dollars. We're talking about a hope that one day Jesus is going to return and make all things new. That he's going to right every wrong. But there's a, there's, a, there's a future hope. First Peter, the Apostle Peter, verse 5, he describes that hope as imperishable. That it's undefiled. It's never fading. That it's reserved for you in heaven and protected by the power of God. You see, one day Jesus is going to reconcile everything. He's going to right every wrong. He's going to hold every injustice accountable. Peace is going to be washing over all of creation. The lamb and the lion are going to lay down together. You see, the promise of that future hope is changing everything for the Colossians. But that's the encouragement in God's word for our church family. It's bearing fruit in the Colossians from the day they heard it. Until now, that they understood the grace of God. And that's what we want to see in our church family. That's what God's word is lifting our eyes to see that future hope. That's the explanation for the transformation. And I get it. It's hard. It's hard, young people. I know it's hard to be motivated by something in the future. Right? If, I, if you tell a young person, hey, I'll give you one Slurpee today or I'll give you two Slurpees in a week. What are they going to pick every time? One Slurpee today, right? And that's true for adults also. It's hard to be motivated by what's in the future. Now, we got the squeaky wheels in life. We got the demands, things break, bosses yelling at us, right? We're feeling like that guy trapped in a room, getting irritated, getting frustrated, but we need to remember. And there's a hope. There's the promise of a hope in Christ that's far greater than we can ever imagine. I know it's hard. It's hard for me, but let's, let's pray for that, church family. Will you pray for that with me? Will you pray for Jesus Christ to, to lift our eyes to, to the hope that is in him? To cry out to Jesus, help us, Jesus, fix our eyes. Help us not to forget. Help us to remember the hope that is laid up for us in heaven. To walk in faith that that hope is a reality. Right? To have... The very words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, For I consider, for I consider the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us in Christ. Did you hear that? He says, For I consider. He's thinking about it. He's not denying it. There are hardships. There are challenges. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us one day in Christ Jesus. Will you pray that prayer with me, church family? 
so that we can see that type of agape love just bearing fruit everywhere in our church family over and over. That people hear about North Village Church. You know, people in Austin, they hear about North Village Church. Isn't that cool? Like when I go places, where you, where you Pastor, North Village, I've heard, about, I've heard about North Village Church. It used not to be that way. Who? Like they've heard about, they've heard about you. Would, would, you, would you pray that Jesus would lift our eyes for, for a love for the saints, not just for the men, women, and children in this room, but for the world? That the world would hear about the love, the transformative work of God in North Village Church? That the saints in India and Bangladesh and Iran and Venezuela and Ukraine and China and Vietnam, I've heard of North Village Church. Will you pray? Will you cry out to God? To have that kind of heart in our church family where we consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's to be revealed to us in Christ Jesus? Won't you pray that prayer with me, church family? Listen, if you've yet to begin a relationship with Jesus, you're invited to do that this morning. Like I know we're in Texas, the Bible Belt, a myriad of spiritual language out there. He's brought you here this morning to meet him. Romans teaches us, if you believe, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, that you will be saved. Believe that this morning. Be transformed by his love. Eternally transformed. We you bow your hands and close your eyes? Colossians 1, we end with some questions every Sunday just to help us stay on the same page. So just reflect. Now, what is distracting us from our hope reserved in heaven? That's an honest question for all of us to ask ourselves. God's word is speaking to you this morning. No matter where you are in that spiritual journey, what's distracting you from, from your eyes being on that hope that is reserved for you in heaven? And that as God speaks to you this morning through his word, through his spirit, that you'd repent, that you'd turn to Jesus, that you would confess, that you would be reminded that you're already a saint, that you're, that you're in Christ, and that it can't be taken. But sometimes we forget. So confess that to him. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask for his help to remember and that you would rejoice. That Jesus is bearing fruit in our church. Might he do more? Jesus is bearing fruit. Agape type love. Might he do more? Might he expand our eyes, our thoughts, to see the saints of the world. Men, women, and children gathering right now around the world centering their eyes on Jesus. Might he stir in us a love for the saints around the world, not just in Pillow Elementary, not just in Austin, Texas, but around the world, all the saints. Well, what does that look like? I don't know. I don't know. Money, is it time, is it going there? I... Might it be supernatural? Might it be unexplainable? Might there be no other reason that we could explain it other than to point to Jesus? The explanation for the transformation, the hope that one day he's going to return and well, it just changes how I live. We'll have men and women to pray for you, to pray with you in the back. Would you take advantage of that this morning? You're not intended to go alone. You're not intended to answer these questions on your own. You need people. I need people. We all need people. Let him pray with you. Let him pray for you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.